Okay, well, we're changing other slides. I'll introduce our uh, third speaker for the session. Our third speaker is Frank Zeppenfeld, who works for the Telecommunications Department of the European Space Agency, actually quite near where I live. Um, Frank is going to talk about uh, an overview of the research and development project sponsored by ESA. Uh, in particular, he's going to include a small, small section on the funding possibilities of those programs, uh, which might be of interest to people in our community. So, with that, I'll hand over to you, Frank. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> we present a few projects from the European Space Agency, in particular from the Telecommunications Department from the European Space Agency. It's a community which is maybe not so known to the, the research uh, academy, um, but let's say ESA is a, a, like a European body. It's a bit like the Commission, the European Commission, but sponsoring, let's say, in this case, telecommunication project would have to do with satellite communications. We are, let's say, quite narrow-minded uh, looking at satellite communications. This is a, a quick overview of the, let's say, the sites we have. And we are located in the Netherlands, in Noordwijk, with a surfnet connection. And this is an example of our uplink facilities with different ground stations, more or less over the world, for satellite control, but also for pure satellite communications. It is important maybe to make the difference that a lot of people in the space community are working to, let's say, IP to the satellites, to, let's say, telecommand and telemetry to satellites. We are, our group is more working on IP via the satellite. The way ESA works is that ministries of education and science, they put lots of money into ESA and we distribute that again via projects and certain policies and let's say priorities. You see all the flags, all the members of ESA. The Greek flag is missing. Greek of Greece is a member of the European Space Agency. We have, um, let's say, funding schemes uh, quite different from the, the Commission. We have, uh, let's say, requests for tender. You can also come up with unsolicited proposals for network and projects. But mainly, we, found, we fund research into satellite communication systems. But also, we look at, let's say, prototyping and development. So mainly hardware developments. Most of our product projects, there is boxes coming out, uh, and also some software, but lots of hardware for communications. And the third pillar that we use, that is services. Um, <coughs> He would like to see all those things demonstrated. We have quite a number of projects which are 50% funded, and they are, let's say, very close to the market. Um, services, multi multimedia home platform, that's quite a, a hot uh, topic. And a lot of content distribution networks which are running via satellite. All the projects I'll be talking about, that is all far below one gigabit speeds, uh, let's say 155 megabits, that is really the maximum here in our satellite communication project. But uh, let's say it's 155 megabit to millions of users at the same time. That is a bit our niche market for uh, IP networking. Um, we are also doing a few things together with UNESCO. Uh, comes a bit to this cultural grid, but then more the technical implementation to that. And there were quite a lot of data medicine projects, and one of them is running now in, the, in Baghdad. Uh, so, I'll run through a few uh, projects and look at satellite-specific issues related to IP. And you see here a bit, let's say, a known list of uh, problems in the normal networking world. And we look at them in the satellite world. And we hope that in our projects, people, there will be more people also from the terrestrial world, because so many problems have been solved already in the terrestrial world, but still need to be solved in the satellite world. Good. This PEPS acronym, that is maybe, it's not a policy and uh, enforcement point, as in the DIFSERF terminology. This is a performance enhancing proxy that it has to do with all the problems for TCP over satellites, uh, taking into account the long delay of the hop from the Earth station to the satellite and back. Good. Um, previously, a lot of satellites was more or less you uplink data and it's going to the user. 
and that was typical broadcasting scenario. Analog television and then digital television using DVB, digital video broadcasting via satellite. That is where the, the S is from. Uh, but more and more we see standards evolving also for a return link channel. So that is the DVB RCS, return channel via satellite. That is a standard that has been heavily pushed by, uh, by ESA, by the European Space Agency, to have a common format for access to the satellite. Now, there's a lot of European manufacturers that adhere to that standard, and we have finally a bit of a, an interoperable medium access and link layer to the satellite. Um, a step further uh, is that we see let's say architectures, and this is still a bit in the research part, that do bridging or MPE, this is almost similar to MPEG packets, MPE routing on board. Now why would you do that? Uh, the example is here, that uh, suppose you have something like a switch or a router in the sky, that it, and you have different antennas, let's say to uh, Europe, and uh, let's say behind the, the Ural, for example, in, in Russia, it would be ideal if the satellite could look into the packet and depending on the content of the packet really send the packet down the, re the right antenna. So this is what we call onboard routing. There is uh, a project I would like to show you a few slides on which will be linking South Americas and Spanish and a part of Europe using this kind of methodology. Um, this project is called Ameris, and uh, this is a project, uh, let's say, very typical. It's 50% sponsored by industry and 50% by the European Space Agency. And this is all about, let's say, putting a complete IP network on a satellite, an IP networking overlay on a bidirectional satellite network. Now, that is the combination of two technologies, that DVB-S technology and DVB-RCS. And we combine that and we end up with something like a switch router in the sky. Practically, let's say the network of that, uh, you will have the satellite here that is going to be launched in June 2004. <coughs> and that is, let's say, an experimental payload on a HISPASAT, let's say that's the Spanish uh, telecom operator for satellite. And they have given us, let's say, so many kilograms, and we are putting this router on board there. That router is, uh, let's say, as big as, that, as this uh, projector, and it's full of, let's say, custom-made ASICs, and that is quite a, a long development. Uh, but we are quite happy that we have now a flight opportunity. Now, the difficulty is now to integrate this with common IP services and also the common IP control plane. We will have, um, let's say, uh, gateway stations. So gateway stations, we mean uh, larger user terminals that can inject lots of traffic uh, and have connections to the, let's say, to the internet or to uh, ISDN, PBXs, etc. Services that will be running is would say typical ISP and VPN access. It's a bit uh, DSL in the sky, I would say ADSL in the sky, um, let's say architecture. But more and more we see um, the need for very specific multicast groups. In the, the satellite world, you see more and more like micro broadcasters. In the internet, let's say everybody has his website and can do push traffic. In the satellite world, that's not so often you would need an enormous ground station to inject streaming traffic, for example. Now, this would allow people with a, let's say, 2,000 euro terminal to uplink, let's say, up to 8 megabits of streaming traffic to millions of users. Now, the beauty of this system is then that it has four spot beams, and it will automatically look in which spot beams there are members. So this needs to be integrated with IGMP control plane. Now there is where we experience uh, real practical problems. Um, the other issue on quality of service, previously in satellite communications it was like one big pipe used for trunking. If we have now more and more, let's say, little companies, more SOHO access, 
there is definitely a need for quality of service and this would be the first system that is doing that. So this system here will be let's say quality of service aware in the sky. For the multicast integration we normally had in our satellites more or less broadcast. Let's say there was not a single interaction with uh, let's say multicast routing or uh, IGMP planes. And if you have now have multiple spot beams, so multiple antennas, you would like that you are not using that capacity if there is no members in that multicast group. Uh, that is something uh, that is now, let's say, being coded, and we see there quite a need for interaction with, let's say, the lower layer planes. There it becomes quite complicated. Uh, that is a bit to do with the satellite topology, because the satellite topology is, is a bit a strange network. It's it's like an ethernet in one direction, and it's lots of point-to-point -point links in the return direction. It's, I think it's very related to all the unidirectional link, the UDLR research that has been done uh, mainly by uh, UDCAST uh, in France. What we think is really missing in satellite multicast, we have an enormous cloud of users, millions of users. That is a, like a large flat network. There are no mechanisms to make, let's say, VPNs, to separate them. We cannot use, let's say, just SDP and SAP uh, for service announcement. Uh, there needs to be more work done on, let's say, electronic program guides, etc., for IP services over satellite. And moreover, uh, we think there is still, this is a system we are launching, will have some uh, parts implemented of, let's say, PIM routing protocol linked to the satellite but still you would like that the satellite would be completely PIM sparse mode aware so that it's not starting to forward traffic into certain spot beams where there are no members. The other issue is uh, uh, IGMP in general. Um, because this is such a strange topology, like, like an Ethernet forward and this point-to-point -point links in the back, uh, if you are a bit aware how IGMP works, that a lot of other hosts on an Ethernet also listen to lots of IGMP reports, not to send lots of data that they're still interested in this group. Um, that is something that won't work in satellite. If one user is saying, I am uh, not interested in this group, and IGMP reports need to be uh, rebroadcasted over the satellite link, because it's not a full broadcast network. That is work we are doing, and that is resulting in, let's say, drafts to uh, IETF and ATC committees to adapt IGMP timers and to, let's say, request from hosts that they are uh, allowing a larger response time to the IGMP reports or the IGMP queries. Sorry. From the quality of service in the satellite network, um, we have will currently have gateways and they can be linked to beautiful DIFSERV enabled networks and everything on it, but we have very little means to put that further on the satellite. There is a lot of things missing in that satellite station. There is no, there is no good, good MIP uh, definition for DVB equipment for encapsulators, because in the end you will need to map IP quality of service on some kind of link layer. It, it looks a bit like uh, previous research, I think, on IP quality of service to ATM classes of services. How to put uh, certain diff serves on, let's say, VBR or ABR. Um, also, the services for the voice over IP. Um, it's known what voice over IP needs, but how to implement that in a satellite network where you have shared access to a common medium in a kind of, let's say, time division multiplexing, a kind of demand assignment medium access, that is quite uh, a problem. Y you can show that, let's say, in several conferences this is being addressed, that it has no use, for example, satellite communication to, do, to use certain codecs, because the granularity of the satellite access will not give you any benefit at all. So we try to initiate some work uh, on this quality of service, uh, both in the forward link, so let's say from a gateway station to the users, but also from the users back to the gateway station. Now one study that was uh, it's just finalized last December, that's done by uh, the people you see there mentioned, uh, the German company VCS Engineering, University of Salzburg, 
critical software and input from us. Um, we wanted to have a diff surf aware satellite station for uplink. That would mean that up to the last bit where the bit goes into, into the air, there needs to be uh, the ability for scheduling, policing, shaping, etc. All the elements in the diff surf architecture. Um, that has been done, simulated with NS2, and implemented in our hub station. We also looked a bit uh, for interaction with the satellite link providers, and so far, um, this seems to fit their requirements. Just quickly to see how that looked like. Um, this is how it was tested in our Earth station. You could imagine that this is a this box is a service links provider. That's, let's say, uh, Astra in, in Luxembourg. They provide satellite capacity. And you buy from them typically, let's say, five megabits uh, per year. And you sign a contract for three years. This would be, let's say, BT Ignite. This would be uh, Deutsche Telekom, let's say, as ISPs. And they will all have currently long service level agreements for at least three years to buy so many megabits and then with a certain satellite footprint. That's all they sell. And they would need, let's say, a more granular uh, ID of services. Now, we looked into SLA trading protocols. The current SLA drafts there are there were, in our opinion, too complicated. So what has been implemented is uh, using an older protocol, the following mechanism. That, let's say BT Ignite is asking to the Astra Earth Station, would you have for me uh, so many megabits gold service with a certain packet drop rate? Now, in that case, Astra would answer, uh, yes, I have that, but that will cost you so and so much. So this is already the beginning of SLA trading. That is implemented with a protocol called IOTP, Internet Open Trading Protocol. That is a, it's a fat RFC, and it's only a few messages that we use from that protocol. Otherwise, it would be far too complicated. So this is for the financial arrangements and to come to an agreement. Now it still needs to be provisioned. Uh, for that, it's all COPS PR, and in, let's say used in this uh, diff surf domain. So. Up to here, let's say when the bits go into the air, you are fully in control of the bits, and there is a complete billing mechanism using IOTP. So this would provide satellite uplink providers with a more flexible way to sell their capacity using this diff surf uh, architecture. Now, this is, let's say, maybe the easy part that is going in the forward link, where lots of aggregated traffic, real, let's say, diff surf approach would fit there. In the return link, it's more uh, difficult. Let's say we have one earth station, one user behind it, and he has different services, and that is using, uh, let's say, a certain medium access layer, which is quite complicated. It's a satellite access layer. It's probably as really uh, as complicated if you go to the QS definition for A2211, if you really want to do QS on that access, that medium access layer. So we miss some mechanisms like this. Uh, and therefore, we did another study, and that is just starting to be able to do this mapping a bit better. So practically, we're looking for the following uh, thing. That was the same what the ATM IP people were looking for. Let's say this is a host, this is a terminal, and I want to do voice over IP with, uh, let's say, this codec. And that needs to be mapped in certain, in DGBRCS, this is called uh, a resource allocation. You can have, uh, let's say, a bit fixed bit rate. You can have a, a rate-based assignment. You have kind of volume-based assignments. There's all kind of possibility, and that needs to be a mapping. Good. The following is the on the IPv6 uh, front. We we follow a lot the let's say European projects, and there's enormous amount of IPv6 uh, work ongoing. Not many of the previous, let's say, the fifth framework program are addressing specifically satellite communications. And let's say it's our worry a bit that the satellite community, community is a bit lagging uh, behind. And therefore, we initiated uh, an ITT. That's the way how we work, an invitation to tender. And that is called preparation for IPv6 and satellite communications. All these teleports you see, let's say, around the world for uplinking IP traffic to ISPs in, in Pakistan and in India, they are, we know they are not prepared. And 
uh, particularly, let's say, the Asian continent, continent, you would expect a more take up of uh, IPv6. So you see here a few tasks that we would like to see done. Uh, and we hope to uh, come to a conclusion to start that work in June and have uh, IPv6 running over satellite. Um, it looks maybe uh, a bit strange that, let's say, IPv6, that should be completely transparent. But if you go into the details of a satellite earth station and the DVDS uh, specification for IP carrying, there's a lot of things missing on the link layer. For example, there is just a missing, missing encapsulation. Uh, there's lots of PPP over, of, let's say, IPv6 over fiber channel, IPv6 over, uh, over all kind of encapsulation uh, methods, but there is not an IPv6 over, let's say, digital video broadcasting. And uh, let's say 50% of the satellite market is almost uplinking IP traffic, so there's a definite need if they want to go to IPv6. Um, I, satellite networks are large flat networks, unidirectional sometimes, sometimes asymmetrical, hybrid. There is no routing experience in those topologies. Um, network management is uh, another problem. Everything is quite uh, strange equipment in a satellite station. On the security issue, uh, there we come to this protocol a performance enhancing proxy that is completely against the end-to-end -end ID of, uh, let's say, the IETF. But this is like a split TCP. The TCP needs very large windows if you want to use that over satellite. I think that's a, a known studied problem, and there's a few RFCs on that. But still, people buy commercial protocol enhancing proxies to have a bit of TCP performance over satellite. Now, all those protocol enhancing proxies in the commercial world, they need a clear TCP header. There is no way you can run ASP or tunnel mode uh, over a satellite. That's a real problem. Furthermore, furthermore, later on when satellites are, will be used also in trunking scenarios, you would like to do MPLS over DVB. Also doesn't exist. So you see that there's all this DVB standard that's really from the broadcasting world. Never somebody thought about doing IP over digital video broadcasting. And there is a lot of um, things going on uh, in, let's say, informal level to increase this uh, encapsulation for IP. What we hope, what will happen, we uh, put out a, a smaller invitation to tender to make prototype implementations of, let's say, DVB receiving cards and a DVB sender. And there, there's a group of, let's say, 70 people that hopes to establish in Vienna at the IETF an IP over DVB working group. There, we will have both there. And uh, let's hope that it works to have uh, some implementation so that we can uh, show that, uh, let's say, that area director that there is a need for some IP over DVB. It's not only DVBS, it's also DVBT and uh, IP over the cable infrastructure, etc. That needs some work. Good. This is a. I was. This is a typo. This should be uh, performance enhancing proxies. That is all the problems over TCP and satellite. I won't spend. Uh, any time uh, on that. The only interesting thing, which is a bit IETF related, that uh, it seems that it's now allowed to use information from the lower layers. Uh, it's a bit like explicit congestion notification. We have lots of information from the lower layer from the satellite, but we wouldn't like to propagate that to the TCP uh, because we would like to have a clean layered structure. But uh, the co-funded project from the uh, Canadian uh, the Communications Research Center in Canada and some smaller company in Canada, Xyphos, they will look at, say, TCP interaction with the lower layers in satellite. Good. On IP security, um, we did some work looking at, let's say, conditional access and transport layer security. Um, I won't go in detail there, but look at the main findings. That satellite is really, that's for multicast only. There is our niche. We have no market on point-to-point -point connectivity. But the problem is that a lot of people just do not have security for multicast. Now, we decided to, to work on that because all these micro-broadcasters that you currently have for streaming data, they need to have security to, let's say, to earn money. So, 
uh, we did work on the secure multicast. As you probably know, there is an ITF, this MSEC group, uh, ASMUC, MSEC now, and there is a draft on GSA KMP, Group Security Associations, mm, what is it, Key Management Protocol, so it's a group key management protocol, an architecture, and also another draft, an ITF draft, I don't know which track status it is, is working on the key distribution for multicast security. This has been uh, implemented and we are quite happy because this is the second implementation now uh, available, so now we have something to go to the IETF and uh, this will be reported upon also in the Vienna uh, IETF. You can imagine that is a real problem if, if you have 10,000 users, they listen to a certain video stream, they have paid for it, then one user is leaving the group, then you would need to rekey all the 9999 others. And that is a, a, scalable, a scalability problem. With this key distribution mechanism, LKE, LKH, this takes more a log logarithmic scale. And important is that keying is distributed also in multicast. Uh, we have tested this and this uh, really seems to work. So the keying traffic is uh, worthwhile, it's, it's far less than the data traffic, it's almost not noticeable. So this is, we think, a quite uh, nice development in the secure multicast area, which is not really satellite specific, but we need it in particular in satellites. Um, this is all done in collaboration with uh, the RFC authors. Uh, mainly from Sparta in the US. Good. Um, I will skip uh, this one. Uh, we disseminate our information mainly in, let's say, reports, which are freely available on IP networking. We hold uh, workshops. We normally don't use the internet for broadcasting. We do that via satellite because our community is normally has satellite receiving capabilities with just a Linux box and your normal television dish. Um, we will work a bit more on uh, integration of terrestrial and satellite networking. That's a bit of an obvious thing. Uh, there is more and more in interest in having more intelligence on board. You could imagine if you really would have your, say, Cisco on board, this would be perfect for reliable multicasting if you have different uh, spot beams, like uh, negative acknowledgments aggregation, for example. Now, there's projects in Japan, US, and a bit in Europe looking at these possibilities or to have, let's say, MPLS switch capability on the router, on the satellite, sorry. Um, what is interesting, maybe, as a research community, that we have cyclic tenders to work on satellite communications, uh, linked also to terrestrial applications. You can, found that, you can find that all on this uh, website. And these are typical projects from 150 kilo euro to 3 million euro, mostly 50% uh, funded. Other information can be found here on the website of us. Um, we are very interested to support any networking activity. And if you are interested in, let's say, working in speeds also lower than the gigabits, but more a very say, specific uh, a market niche in large scale, large geographical distribution of data, then uh, please uh, contact us. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. <laughs>Excellent, Frank, you finished absolutely on time. Are there any questions from the floor? I think we've got one or two, if you don't mind missing the first couple of seconds of yes, coffee. Sir. I can repeat the question if you want. The recent news release from the NASA yep. said that, that they are going to make the accelerator using the Cisco router 3000 yep. over there. Now, what's the impression of yours? Now, there is, um, Cisco has quite an uh, say aggressive space and defense initiative. Uh, I think they're mainly targeting now the defense market, but there's also a bit of space. And they have a very small router, the MAR, Mobile Access Router, that is like a PC-104 board. And that has all the things for mobile IPv4. Now also support multicast uh, IPv4. It's not doing the, the IPv6. And 
they are flying that in the Surrey satellites that they build very small satellites in a disaster monitoring constellation. It's something to do with uh, fires and so a lot of countries are involved. And they will be flying that Cisco. I think there is on purpose not too much publicity on it because they would like to see it uh, working first. But uh, that could be really be a step forward. The problem is only that we see with onboard architectures that putting a Cisco on, let's say, low Earth orbit, that is, let's say, doable. If you go to geostationary heights, then there's so much more radiation and problems and temperatures. So uh, there needs to be very specific ASICs made, uh, and that will take some time. But we think the technology is very interesting. Any more questions? In that case, can we thank all of the three speakers once again? Thanks very much, guys. And thank you for attending.